gonna get started in just a couple minutes. Welcome everybody. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Karee Peterson-Smith, and I'm the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this discussion of South Africa's uh, case charging Israel genocide at the International Court of Justice. The Israeli assault on Gaza has, of course, brought unspeakable horror to Palestinians. The official number of Palestinians killed is over 25,000 people, a number that we know and that the health ministry in Gaza readily admits is, op is, is lower than the reality, uh, given the number of, of people whose bodies simply cannot be counted uh, because of the violence. The number of Palestinians displaced in Gaza today far exceeds the numbers displaced in 1948 during the Nakba, the origin of the colonial violence that has shaped the past 75 years, and among other things, located the vast majority of today's Gazans to Gaza uh, after they were displaced through ethnic cleansing from other parts of historic Palestine. Unfortunately, I could go on in the multidimensional horror that uh, Israel's unleashing and that the United States is supporting in Gaza. But what brings us here today is a conversation about South Africa's case at the International Court of Justice uh, that Israel is committing genocide. As we work here in the United States to do what we can to win a ceasefire and to otherwise disrupt and end US support for Israeli violence, we are challenged to integrate a perspective on international law uh, and what is unfolding at The Hague to integrate that into our work. And that really is the purpose of our discussion today. And we have an incredible panel to open that discussion. Uh, we have Phyllis Bennis, who is the director of the New Internationalism Project at IPS, who has written extensively about international law and about Palestine uh, in particular. We have Craig Mokhyber, who is a practitioner of international law and until October, the director of the New York Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights at the United Nations, who in his uh, last letter to uh, the, the High Commissioner, among other things called what Israel is doing, a textbook genocide. And then we have Salah Hijazi, uh, who is the apartheid free policy coordinator at the BDS National Committee in Palestine. Uh, in addition to the work that he's doing now, Salah is one of the authors uh, a few years ago of Amnesty International's report on apartheid in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Our conversation uh, will last an hour, will end at the hour, and uh, our, our panelists will present first and we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. And please go ahead and feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at the bottom of uh, this window. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Phyllis Bennis. Thank you. Thanks, Karee. Thank you. Karee, and thanks to all of you for joining us today for this discussion. The way we've broken it up, I'm going to start with some discussion about the International Court of Justice, what it is, what it isn't, what it can enforce and what it can't and why it's important. Uh, Craig will follow that with a more specific discussion about what the South African case is all about. And Saleh will, will close us out with the crucial questions about what the strategy is for civil society, for activists, for social movements going forward. So just a note in terms of what we're looking at, and, and one of the reasons it's so extraordinary that it happened this quickly, 
It took about 20 years of the Palestinian rights movement in this country, it was already true in many other places, particularly in Palestine and in South Africa. But in this country, it's taken about 20 years to normalize the discourse about apartheid, for people to understand why apartheid is the accurate and appropriate uh, framework to use in discussing what Israel's policy and treatment of Palestinians looks like. The normalization of the the genocide language took about 20 days, not about 20 years, because of the extremity of the violence that we have all been seeing, people around the world watching it 24-7 uh, as it took shape in Gaza. And of course, with South Africa's own history of apartheid, uh, that combination, along with these kinds of global shifts that were underway, led to and shaped the South African decision to go to the International Court of Justice with a charge of genocide against Israel. So the question arises immediately, what is the International Court of Justice? This is the United Nations Court. It's sometimes known as the World Court. And it's not an independent court like the International Criminal Court. It's run by the United Nations. It's part of the UN system itself. For any of you who have these little handy little books of the, the UN Charter, uh, it includes the, the statute of the International Court of Justice because it's very much part of the UN structure. In the World Court, in the ICJ, there are no criminal charges against individuals. That goes on in the International Criminal Court. This court is only for state versus state cases, often border disputes. In the early 1980s, Nicaragua brought the United States to court, uh, charging that the U.S. had violated international law when it mined the harbors of Nicaragua. And the court indeed found that it was true that the U.S. had violated international law. And of course, at that point, the U.S. just said, well, sorry, we don't accept the jurisdiction of the court, although they had already accepted it in that case. But once they lost the case, they decided they didn't really want to accept the jurisdiction and they walked away, which goes to the question of enforcement, which I'll get to later. But it is primarily about resolving disputes between states. The one other thing that the International Court of Justice does, at the request of the General Assembly of the United Nations, it can issue advisory opinions that can be very, very important. So for example, in 2004, the ICJ issued a, an advisory opinion, a ruling, about the illegality of the apartheid wall that Israel was constructing in and around the West Bank. So that's part of what the court does as well. It's historically part of the post-World War II efforts at, at establishing international law, very much part of the victor's justice of World War II that went on, just like the UN itself. And what we're dealing with now is a dispute between two states. So South Africa has brought charges against Israel for Israel's violation of the Genocide Convention. And I'll come to the convention in a minute too. But just to understand a little bit about how the court functions, there are 15 judges. They're chosen jointly by the Security Council and the, the General Assembly. There needs to be an, an, a majority in both those agencies for picking the judges. The judges are supposed to be independent. They're supposed to be chosen for their skills as, as lawyers and as judges. In the real world, of course, some of them, not all, end up referring to and in many ways holding themselves accountable to uh, the, the positions of their government. But it isn't an absolute. We can't know what the decisions of the court are going to be by figuring out which of the 15 countries represented on the court among the 15 judges. How would those countries vote at the UN? And therefore, that will be the case. It has happened that way on occasion, but it's by far not the only way. These judges are supposed to be independent, and some of them actually act that way. One of the big questions is, how long does it take? These international agencies always take a very long time. And the full decision about whether or not Israel is violating the, the Genocide Convention, we probably won't know for a couple of years. But in this case, they are moving very, very quickly. And just about half an hour ago, we just got confirmation that the court will issue its ruling at one o'clock European time on Friday. That's seven o'clock in the morning here in, in the East Coast. For those of you who want to get up to watch it, it'll be, I'm sure it'll be live streamed. Uh, and that's extraordinarily fast. It's been just two weeks since the oral arguments by 
uh, by Israel and uh, by South Africa and then the Israeli response. So it's very, very fast. And that's because what South Africa asked for, which Craig will talk more about the substance of it, but the form of it, he, they asked for provisional measures to be taken, which is kind of the same thing as in a US court when you ask for a temporary injunction. You're basically saying the final decision is gonna take a while, but in the meantime, really bad stuff is happening and we want an order to stop it. So South Africa asked for a set of these provisional uh, rulings and we'll see on Friday which of them or others may have been authorized uh, by the court. So in, in the question then of enforcement, and this is the last thing I'll say about the court and just tell you a little bit about the genocide convention and then turn it over to Craig. You know, there's an old saying about the Pope, how many divisions does the Pope have when people say, well, the Pope doesn't have an army, how does what anything he says matter? It's true, the International Court of Justice not only doesn't have an army, it doesn't even have a police force. It doesn't even have court officials that have any jurisdiction outside of the court building. What it does have is really important credibility. All the countries that are involved in the United Nations are part of the of the International Criminal Court, uh, sorry, the International Court of Justice, not always the criminal court. Although some of them can opt out of certain kinds of jurisdiction, but the importance of it is that it is seen to represent the, the, the court of the world. They, they don't call it the world court for nothing. And it means that international public pressure can play a very, very important role. Uh, it means that when the court rules that something should happen, it's a recommendation. And it goes first to the Security Council at the UN for enforcement. Now, the Security Council, of course, as we all know, has the problem of the veto. And the US, more than any other country, uses that veto with abandon. And it uses it more often than anything else to defend Israel and to protect Israel from ever being held accountable. We can assume that that would be the case here. But when the veto is used, within 10 days, the General Assembly is then obligated to take up that case. And the decision of the General Assembly, which would only ordinarily be advisory, takes on a new kind of significance. It's not quite officially enforceable, but when it comes because the Security Council is paralyzed with one of the vetoes, it does have more influence. And what it also means <clears throat> is that it becomes a way, sorry, it becomes a way of the General Assembly advising its member states about what they should do. So we saw this a huge amount during the South Africa anti-apartheid movement of the 70s and 80s. In the 80s especially, the General Assembly passed resolution after resolution calling for sanctions, for cutting off uh, investment, for an arms embargo, for cutting South Africa out of the swift system of, of bank exchange. All these things that had been vetoed in the Security Council by the United States, they were passed in the General Assembly. And while the, the GA can't officially enforce it, country after country after country in the General Assembly started doing those things because there were public, there was public pressure, there were movements in all these countries pressing them to say, look, this is now what the General Assembly says we must do. If you want to be abiding by international law, you should do this. And countries started to do it. And eventually it got strong enough that the US itself was forced to give in and impose sanctions and stop defending apartheid South Africa. No one ever thought that would happen, and it did happen, and it can happen again. The last thing I wanna just say briefly is about the Genocide Convention itself. It's a very important human rights related convention. There's 153 countries are members of the, of the convention, are parties to the convention. And unlike a lot of international law, which is very complicated and very hard to understand exactly what it means, the Genocide Convention is actually pretty easy. It basically says there's two things to be for, for acts of violence to become genocidal. One is a specific intent that, is, that a particular group, it can be a racial group, a religious group, uh, an ethnic group, a language group. In this case, the group is the Palestinian population of Gaza, that the intention is to destroy in all or in part the ability of that group to survive. So crucially, it doesn't mean you have to have an, an intent to kill them all. You just have to have the intent to make it impossible for the group to remain a viable group. 
So that's one thing, specific intent. The second thing is you have to do one of, at least one of five named acts. One act would be killing members of the group. Not all necessarily, but any. One would be injuring, seriously injuring members of the group. The third is creating conditions that make it impossible for the group to survive. Things like denying food, water, electricity, shelter, all those things. The fourth is preventing births. Things like destroying hospitals so that women give birth to babies that are underweight or that don't survive far more than they would. And the last is transferring children from, one, from that group to another group. According to the South African papers, as you'll hear, Israel is committing at least four of those five acts, and there is evidence of the specific intent. The one other thing, and I will leave you with this, that's why this convention is so much more important than so many others, is that members of the UN who have signed on to this convention, who are parties to this convention, have obligations as treaty members themselves, even if they're not involved in the case. So if you look at, you know, pick a country, France, Cameroon, whatever country you want, if they're a signatory and a party to the Genocide Convention, they have an obligation when there is the danger of genocide to do everything they can to prevent it. And if there is a genocide, to do everything they can to stop it. And that means that all of us, civil society, has a very specific role to play, that our governments, the US government among them, has obligations not to be complicit in genocide. That's what the case brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights is going to determine also on Friday in their hearing in federal court in, in California. And every other country that's a signatory and a party to the Genocide Convention, people, movements, the movement for Palestinian rights, movements for human rights all around the world, we now have an obligation to make sure that our governments are not complicit, meaning they're not giving the Israelis the power and the military means to commit the genocide, like our government is. It also means that it has an affirmative obligation to do everything possible to stop it. So when we stand out in front of Congress and demand a ceasefire, demand support for humanitarian intervention of you know, allowing in the, the humanitarian organizations, we are not just saying that because it's a moral position. It's also a reflection of international law. That's the role for us. And that's what Saleh will talk about in the third one. But for now, I'll turn it over to Craig to talk about the South African case. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Phyllis. Uh, let me just confirm that I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? I am. Okay. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for uh, kicking us off in, in such a great way. I'll just uh, try to summarize as quickly as I can the substance of, of this case and to kick off by saying that we've, we've been noting that uh, this case started on the 75th anniversary of the Genocide Convention that Phyllis was just describing. Uh, also the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also notably the 75th anniversary of the Nakba in Palestine and the 75th anniversary of apartheid in South Africa. So uh, how historically uh, profound it seems that South Africa is bringing this case in, in the world court as they did on the 29th of uh, December, instituting proceedings against Israel for violations of the Genocide Convention that was described by uh, by, by, by Phyllis. They're basing their jurisdiction on the fact uh, that, uh, you know, they are both parties to the statute of the International Court of Justice and both parties to the Genocide Convention, uh, and that the Genocide Convention specifically names the World Court, the ICJ, as a forum for these genocide-related statements. I think one of the most important things in the South African petition is that it begins with this idea that genocide is a part of a continuum. It's not an, an incident that occurs at a certain moment in time, but it is always a part of a continuum. Um, and that has been, since the very definition of the term by Raphael Lemkin, uh, noticed as, as how these things work. And South Africa points out in the petition that this is happening in the context of 75 years of apartheid, 56 years of belligerent occupation, a 16-year blockade strangling the people of the Gaza Strip, serious ongoing violations of international law, international humanitarian law, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and that Israel's actions on the West Bank um, uh, are also, as they said, intrinsically connected to what Israel is doing in Gaza uh, 
and they provide an important context for what Israel is doing and for what his motives are in Gaza as well. So the court is going to decide if Israel is breaching the genocide convention and then can order these binding measures uh, in order to deal with that. Now, what's very important that Phyllis mentioned is there's also a request from South Africa for provisional measures that she compared to a, a, a temporary injunction, uh, which uh, have been requested in previous cases and are very, very important here, designed to protect against further severe and irreparable harm to the rights of the Palestinian uh, people in, in Gaza. As Phyllis said, a decision on the merits of whether um, Israel is committing genocide and what needs to be done about that could take years. And we're going to be seeing a decision on these provisional measures already at the end of this uh, uh, the end of this week. So uh, in this case, overall, South Africa has submitted an exceptionally strong case. I would say a brilliant application that was very clearly and compellingly argued, extensively documented by South Africa with objective evidence that was drawn from other bodies, from UN and other international institutions and objective sources. That it, from itself is extremely compelling from a legal perspective, right? We never know what's going to happen with a court. All courts are a balance of law and politics. This one is certainly no uh, exception to that with judges from various nationalities appointed, some of them with close relationships or whole lifetimes of careers working in their foreign ministries uh, and so on. So it's always a mix. But from a legal perspective, this is a uniquely strong case charging genocide against, uh, against South Africa. So the real hope here comes from the strength of this case. In my view, it would take extraordinary judicial gymnastics or blatant corruption to avoid ordering most or all of the provisional measures that have been requested, perhaps with some adjustments, and frankly, for a final finding of genocide when the case is finally settled uh, a couple of years down the road. But remember that this first phase, provisional measures that they will decide on, issue the decision on Friday, the standard for this is easier than the final determination. Because to, to issue an order for provisional measures, they only have to um, decide that there's a prima facie case, that it's plausible that genocide might be uh, committed in, in this context. So it's a much lower legal standard, and hopefully that will result in some meaningful decisions coming out on, on Friday. Well, Phyllis said that in order to prove genocide, you have to prove that a specific group has been identified, in this case, Palestinians in Gaza, that there are some specific acts that are enumerated in the convention, at least one of these is being perpetrated. And thirdly, that there is a specific genocidal intent, an intent to destroy these people, either in whole or in part. So South Africa has made a very strong case that the tens of thousands, uh, you know, first on this idea of killings, right? that the tens of thousands uh, of civilians who have been exterminated in a matter of few weeks, probably 12,000 children, 7,000 women, 6,000 men, murdered, countless whole multi-generational families exterminated, erased from the public register, more than 61,000 injured, many thousands still under the rubble, many thousands more dying of disease, and now Israeli imposed starvation. This wholesale slaughter of an imprisoned civilian population where whole neighborhoods have been raised to the ground, massive ordnance dropped on densely populated civilian areas, attacks on homes and refugee camps and hospitals and clinics and ambulances and schools and UN facilities and all civilian infrastructure, that there is a very clear, it seems to me an undeniable case that the act of mass killing is being perpetrated. Secondly, serious harm, both physical and mental. Again, it seems self-evident, although they have made a very strong case when tens of thousands have been wounded, maimed, denied adequate medical care, denied food, water, medicine, shelter, widowed, orphaned, exposed to disease and, and terrorized, uh, that you have that kind of harm. There's a quote in the case that South Africa quotes of a doctor in Gaza talking about what's happening now because there are no medical facilities and anesthesia and all these sorts of things. And they quoted him saying, I was forced to do dressing changes on massive wounds, excruciatingly painful wounds. This was a girl with her whole body covered in shrapnel. She was nine years old. I had to change and clean these wounds with no anesthetic and no analgesic. Her dad was crying, I was crying, and the poor child was screaming. It seems to me they have made the case for these kinds of mental and physical harms. Thirdly, and this one is very particular, it's this, uh, uh, this act which is described in the convention of deliberately inflicting on the group 
conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. That is usually a construction that has to be built. But in Gaza, you have a uniquely clear case where Israel has interned 2.3 million civilians in Gaza, most of them poor, food insecure, children, most of them refugees already, imposed a siege on them since 2005, restricting food, water, sanitation, medicine, movement, all things necessary for a decent life. And then since October, making that siege total, cutting off all food, water, fuel, other essentials, already displacing 2 million women, children, and men uh, forcibly, uh, destroying the homes, schools, hospitals, churches, all those things, food production, civilian infrastructure, refugee camps, all of these things, um, that you have a particularly clear case that they've made of this idea of creating conditions of life uh, that are unsustainable. So, and, and Phyllis mentioned, there's also uh, a, a case being made of reproductive violence, of interfering with, with birth through destruction of all uh, obstetric and gynecological facilities and cutting off of water and sanitation and medicines and, and so on. So you have a lot of the acts, you only need one, you've got several of the acts for which a very strong factual case has already been made, and it seems to me is undeniable. What is the intent there? And again, South Africa recognizes that this is usually the hard part of a case to make. But in this case, you have a very unique situation that means you don't have to dig through dusty government archives to find secret communications on intent because the senior political and military leadership in South Africa has been declaring its intent openly and publicly and on the record. And South Africa presents several pages of direct quotes of the senior leadership in Israel describing their intent, which is extremely damning. There is a climate of impunity, which has grown up over many years because the US and the UK and parts of Europe have protected Israel from accountability that has led these leaders to believe that they can say this openly and publicly without any uh, impact. And so that's why we end up with a database having been created of more than 500 genocidal quotes uh, describing that, that intent. And here, South Africa has shown that they're not talking about just peripheral characters, but the president, the prime minister, at least seven cabinet ministers, senior military commanders and others stating in their own words, uh, their intention, uh, genocidal intention in this case, dehumanizing Palestinians as animals, subhuman, cancer, ants, vermin, terrorists, declaring an intent to wipe out all of Gaza, not to distinguish between civilians and combatants, to bury the Palestinians alive, to create another Nakba, the first genocidal ethnic purge uh, that happened in 1948. Uh, and then the prime minister, as we've all heard on several occasions, invoking the biblical verse about Amalek, um, uh, when speaking to troops and to the public uh, in, in his country, commanding that quote, the entire population be wiped out, that none be spared, men, women, suckling babies and livestock, end quote. In other words, the leadership have made their own case for intent, and South Africa has merely reproduced that in their own words in one of the most compelling cases of genocidal intent that you're going to see in a legal um, in a legal document. And what's interesting about that is South Africa also points out um, that these orders uh, and these statements have been absorbed, repeated, and then implemented by Israeli soldiers with horrifying genocidal impact as well. Um, the request for immediate provisional measures that they've taken, you know, uh, they say that you know, if these measures are not provided, South Africa has said, you'll end up with ongoing extreme and irreparable harm suffered by the Palestinians, a continuation of the horrors that we have just uh, described. And uh, what they requested for is an immediate suspension of military operations to take no more steps in support of those operations, to implement the genocide convention, preventing uh, any further genocide, to desist from any acts prohibiting the convention, killing and causing harm, inflicting conditions, all those things we described. Uh, stop all expulsions and forced displacements and stop depriving the people of water and food and humanitarian assistance and fuel and shelter. Uh, you know, call back your, uh, your military uh, actors, preserve evidence, allow a fact-finding missions from the outside world to report periodically to the court and not to aggravate the situation at all. That's what they're asking for. That's what we're gonna hear about on Friday. We'll either get all of that or some of that. We'll have to wait to see what happens on Friday. And then the ultimate relief that South Africa is asking for in a final decision of the court sometime down the road 
is that Israel is in breach of its obligations under the convention. It has to take all reasonable measures to prevent genocide, that it has breached its obligations. It has to cease those breaches, cease harming the Palestinian people. It must punish those who have perpetrated these crimes, preserve evidence, make reparations to the Palestinians, allow the safe return of all the Palestinians, uh, respect their human rights and perse persecution, uh, meet their obligations of reconstruction and guarantees of non-repetition. Again, that's, that is for down the road, probably um, uh, a couple of years. Um, so all of those elements have been very strongly set out in the South African uh, case. I, I would just say, if we have time, a quick note about how Israel has sought to respond to that, uh, uh, to that case. And... Um, I mean, I'll just start by saying the Israeli response was strikingly weak. Uh, in, in some sense, it's not surprising because as you listen to the response that they launched in the court, it became clear pretty quickly that they were not making a legal argument for the benefit of the court. They were using the plat. It seems to me they were using the platform of the court to try to speak to Western public opinion. Uh, maybe more broadly public opinion, but in particular Western public opinion, uh, so that they could continue to count on the support of the West in defending it, because there was very little legal defense. I mean, beyond a rather bumbling performance of some of uh, Israel's counsel in this case, um, uh, the bulk of their presentation was composed of legally irrelevant assertions. Uh, those assertions that they made also were made without evidence, unlike the South African petition, they ignored the evidence that was presented by South Africa, not challenging it in any way. They launched a number of inappropriate ad hominem attacks on the on the South Africans, which are not legal arguments, and then raised some at best questionable procedural technicalities as a challenge. They, they accused South Africa of lying, accused them of collaborating with terrorists. They said all the casualty figures are lies and so on. Uh, no evidence for any of that. Then they tried to rally sympathy, claiming that somehow um, because uh, some Israelis are uh, Jewish, that uh, they cannot be charged with, uh, with, with genocide, that genocide prevention is about them, and therefore they can't be perpetrating these. Um, uh, the charges of, of genocide are anti-Semitic, um, uh, and that they are, in fact, uh, Israel, Israel is, in fact, the real victims. Well, there's no legal value in those arguments, whatever you think about them. They tried to argue that history started on October 7th, uh, to remove the context that was set out and that, that nothing was um, relevant before then. That, again, is, is irrelevant in a, in a legal argument. They tried to argue that civilians and civilian objects, to the extent that they have been harmed, uh, those were legitimate targets because Gaza is a, is a terrorist stronghold and every person who was killed was a human shield and the schools and mosques and hospitals were military installations. First of all, that's contrary to the evidence that we have seen so far, uh, but it also ignores the requirements of international humanitarian law and has the effect of dehumanizing the victims. It's not a strong case for them to make. The centerpiece of their argument was effectively to say Hamas is horrible, and then to list all of the horrible things that they accuse Hamas of. Again, this is an irrelevant legal argument because no matter how awful they think Hamas is, it doesn't justify genocide as a matter of law. Hamas is not on trial. They're not there to defend themselves. And the court has no jurisdiction over Hamas. It only has jurisdiction over states. Um, they even claim that most of the damage was actually caused in Gaza, was actually caused by Hamas, not by Israel, because Hamas had either intentionally or accidentally blown up all the buildings uh, and, and, and so on. Then they tried to argue self-defense. And this is not very legally compelling because it's ungrounded in law. It's irrelevant to the charges against them. Um, they don't have an Article 51 right of self-defense under the charter to wage war on Gaza, only to repel attacks and so on. Um, and, and, and these acts are unlawful, even if self-defense was one of their motives uh, in, in this case. But this is an area that can be tricky for the judges, at least politically, if not with some legal implications as well. Israel tried to argue that if you tell us to stop what we're doing in Gaza, you're leaving us defenseless because you're not telling Hamas to stop fighting. But that's not really what this order of ceasing their military host, uh, hostility in, in Gaza would mean. They could still repel attacks. They just need to stop these genocidal acts of massive destruction uh, in Gaza and can't do it under uh, Article 51 claims. So that's it. The, the, the other defense they had was kind of the whoops defense. If there is some destruction happening there, it's accidental. We're not intending to harm civilians. 
it just is a it is a part of uh, of war. Again, this is quite contrary to the evidence that has piled up against them on on this issue. There was some fig leafing. So the day before the hearings, they released in English a video of Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, talking about you know all of these pure intents and efforts to protect civilians and so on. Uh, quite a transparent effort at fig leafing that because of you know the trickle of aid trucks, the leafleting and so on, none of these were effective in relieving the impacts on, on civilians. Um, that's not evidence uh, that would counteract the acts that you're actually perpetrating. They tried to argue that, Oct that uh, October 7th was terrible, um, uh, which it was, uh, but that because it was terrible, that's why what, you know anything that we're doing is because of that. That sounded to me like a self-indictment. Genocide is use kogans. It's a peremptory norm of international law. No matter what happens, it doesn't give you a right to carry out uh, genocide. And then the last thing that they argued were these technicalities. First, there's no genocide, so the court doesn't have uh, jurisdiction. Well, the court is there precisely to determine if there is genocide, so that won't hold. They tried to argue there's no proof of a, dis of a dispute between South Africa and, uh, and Israel because there weren't enough diplomatic communications that happened before the case was brought. That seems to me particularly weak because there were a number of diplomatic communications that were then cut off uh, by the uh, by the Israelis and you know how how much is enough when genocide is taking place? Not a very compelling uh, argument. Um, uh, and they tried to argue that there's no urgency, no risk of irreparable harm, so you don't need provisional measures. Well, there may not be risk of uh, uh, of irreparable harm for the perpetrators, but is clear from South Africa's case the risk of irreparable harm to tens of thousands of Palestinians uh, in in Gaza. So we had a very strong case presented by South Africa, a legally weak case presented by Israel, but it doesn't mean that South Africa will prevail. Political bias and Western government pressure are real factors, but the court would be in a dangerous territory if it went too far in trying to appease the West here. You can't just count up the judges by nationality, as uh, Phil has hinted, and determine what the outcome will be, because you have to temper that with the fact that South Africa has a very strong legal case that there is the 16th judge, which is public opinion and the mobilizations that are happening around the world of which the court will be aware. The court is also bound by its own jurisprudence and its own precedents and by the language of the Genocide Convention. And they are genuinely concerned about the reputation of the court and of international law. So I don't think you can simply count up the judges and determine what the outcome will be. Maybe I'll stop there so that we can uh, uh, say, uh, preserve the rest of the time and hear from Saleh. Beautiful. Thank you, Craig. And uh, now I will pass it to Saleh Hijazi. Well, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, and, and thanks for having me and greetings from Occupied Ramallah. Um, I want to bring to the discussion two points which are related. The first relates to the Palestinian reading uh, or how we understand the meaning of the International Court of Justice case that South Africa has brought. And the second relates to uh, the meaning of the case in relation to the Western dominated international system. And uh, on the first point, Israel is on trial. This is unprecedented. It signals a break uh, that uh, just uh, a little time ago we could not uh, see, imagine could happen in the iron-clad impunity that Israel enjoys, provided by the U.S. and, and uh, other Western allies. And this provides a great strategic opportunity for us. The initial outcome of this trial with regards to the request for provisional measures is, is very crucial for what is happening in Gaza. It could have an impact on what's happening on the ground as described by Phyllis and, uh, uh, and Craig. The South Africa application speaks to the imminent priorities uh, that Palestinians have set for the moment, which are imposing on the US-Israel genocidal axis an immediate and permanent ceasefire lifting the deadly siege, allowing essential goods and services into Gaza unimpeded, and defeating the U.S.-Israeli plans for forced dis displacement of the Palestinians in Gaza. And our hope that the provisional measures by the court, which we will hear on Friday, will work towards these objectives. But most importantly, an order of provisional measures, and, and, and regardless of the details of, of what provisional measures the court rules, means, as Craig said, that the court believes in the possibility 
of the charge of genocide against Gaza. This will be historic. The court believes Israel is possibly committing genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. And this is a major contribution to the strategy aimed at exposing Israel's settler colonial apartheid regime that the Palestinian anti-apartheid movement, uh, which the BDS movement has been leading, has been working on since 2001, and towards a major achievement in terms of cutting complicity with it. We have been working with a South African civil society, government, and political forces very closely over the past few years with regards to the building of the anti-apartheid movement and understand that this move at the International Court of Justice is strategic and not only reactive in response to the genocide or tactical with regards to the ceasefire. This is reflected in the ICJ, uh, uh, it, it, the, the South Africa's ICJ application or case uh, and, and South Africa here, Craig quoted this, and I, I want to do it again. South Africa, in the opening, says that it's important to place the acts of genocide in the broader context of Israel's conduct towards Palestinians during its 75-year-long apartheid, its 56-year-long belligerent occupation of Palestinian territory, and its 16-year-long blockade of Gaza, including the serious and ongoing violations of international law associated therewithin, including grave breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention and other war crimes and crimes against humanity. The facts relied on by South Africa in the application and to be further developed in the proceedings established that against the background of apartheid, expulsion, ethnic cleansing, annexation, occupation, discrimination, and the ongoing denial of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, Israel, since 7th of October in particular, has failed to prevent genocide and has failed to prosecute the direct and public incitement to genocide. This is an end of quote. So putting Israel on trial for genocide at the ICJ and as contextualized in, in the South Africa uh, application to the court exposes and undermines its settler colonial bases. It is now up to us to use that in the, to the best of our abilities and regardless of the legal proceedings and, and their outcome, as Craig said, that may take years. This is in line with the Palestinian consensus that was reflected in the unified Palestinian call for a global front to dismantle Israel's settler colonialism and apartheid, which was launched in January 2023 and contributes to it. The call is a result of strategic work in Palestine to build consensus around narrative framing and objectives even in the absence of a renewed national liberation vision and strategy or a unified leadership of the Palestinian people, as the situation is now. In that call, we say the dismantling of Israel's regime of settler colonialism and apartheid is an indispensable condition for the Palestinian people to exercise our full legitimate and inalienable rights as stipulated in international law. Foremost among these rights are the right to self-determination of the entire indigenous Palestinian people on our national territory and the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their original homes and lands and to receive reparations as stipulated in the UN General Assembly Resolution 194. To this end, we call on governments, parliaments, and political parties in the Arab world and globally to contribute to dismantling Israel's regime of settler colonialism and apartheid, starting with imposing a comprehensive military and security uh, embargo on it ending all commercial and financial agreements with it, and banning all products of companies complicit in its occupation, colonization, and apartheid. It also calls on all governments to treat the Israeli occupation's political, security, and military leaders as war criminals by trying them and banning them from entering their countries and by putting pressure on the International, court of Just uh, International Criminal Court to try them as well. Uh, this case at the ICJ may also, uh, as well put a lot of pressure on the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court uh, to further the investigation that has been ongoing and issue arrest warrants. The Unified Palestinian Call also uh, it calls on people uh, of the world and their democratic and progressive forces that uphold peace and justice to strengthen the growing global state of solidarity with the Palestinian people and our just cause by supporting and actively participating in the global Palestinian-led 
boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. So Israel on trial for genocide, with the court believe, with the court affirming the plausibility of the charge, helps us expose that regime for what it is. It helps with the mainstreaming of the view of its criminality, apartheid, and genocide, and allows us to further the building of grassroots power to affect policy change towards ending complicity and achieving justice, which is basically the theory of change of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And this brings me to the second point, which relates to the global implications of the genocide in Gaza and the need for collective intersectional work to stop it. Israel is carrying out the genocide in full military, financial, political, and diplomatic partnership with the United States and other Western colonial powers. This is the world's first live stream genocide, and it provides the hegemonic West an opportunity to test a new doctrine of unaccountable, unmasked, and extreme violence against those who challenge Western powers and their interests. This would replace the already unjust and oppressive world order that has existed since the Second World War, formally ruled by international law with a further entrenching of a might makes right system. If Israel evades accountability for the genocide in Gaza with its Western enabled mad dog doctrine, the already thin credibility of international law will be irreversibly undermined. This poses a serious threat to weaker nations and communities worldwide that in seeking liberation and justice, dare to defy and resist systems of Western domination, oppression, and subjugation. Israel's 75-year-old regime of settler colonialism and apartheid will become a role model for this new order. This further emphasizes what South African jurist, who is currently part of the South African legal team at the ICJ, uh, Professor John Dugard, uh, who said that Palestine is the litmus test of the system of international law and human rights. So with Israel on trial at the ICJ and when it comes to the United Nations and its, its, its institutions, this can be a beginning or a substantial contribution to the decolonization and democratization of the United Nations and its instruments. This is something that we should indeed be speaking about more, and especially at this time with Israel on trial for genocide at the ICJ. And this is why it is important among others, other reasons, to build intersectional coalitions or partnerships and work together towards collective objectives where the liberation of Palestine is always part and parcel of the other struggles it intersects with for freedom, justice, and equality. Now, I think it's important to say from uh, the BDS movement perspective that, you know, and, and from a Palestinian perspective, that we know that international law does not alone bring about justice. Human agency does. And our movement, that BDS movement, is fundamentally about building people power to ensure accountability, to end state, corporate, and institutional complicity with Israel's regime of apartheid and genocide in accordance with international law. Putting Israel on trial at the ICJ for genocide and ruling on the plausibility of genocide, hopefully on Monday, provides an unprecedented opportunity for us to start seeing policy change that ends complicity and the isolation of the genocidal apartheid regime, including by imposing lawful sanctions, military embargo, but also kicking out Israel from international fora, very similar to what happened to South Africa, apartheid South Africa at the time, including the UN General Assembly, the Olympics Committee, FIFA, and, and others. Uh, finally, um, and, and hopefully we have time for, for some, some questions, I want to share very quickly uh, with everybody here about Israel Apartheid Week uh, this year, which will be for the entire month of March. Uh, the call will be issued later and can be shared with whoever is interested. Of course, we'll share uh, um, uh, through our social media channels. Uh, and we will ask everyone to join us by building campaign milestones or mobilizing for new campaigns. The Israel Apartheid Week uh, uh, this year, which is its 20th year, will not just be about educating about Israeli apartheid and settler colonial uh, Satirical colonialism uh, as it was uh, before. We want to take this year meaningful action, meaningful steps, campaigning uh, uh, to stop the genocide and 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 uh, end apartheid. Thanks very much. Thank you, Salah, and thank you to all of our panelists.
um, for this amazing panel. We have a few minutes for questions and answers, and we have one question um, that I think you can all respond to, which is, what can ordinary citizens do to help Palestinians? Um, question for a long time, but particularly in this moment. And I'll, I'll just add to that a uh, really basic kind of point of information uh, question, which is, Phyllis mentioned that the uh, decision, uh, the provisional decision from the ICJ should happen this Friday, seven o'clock Eastern. Where does one watch it? If, if one wants to watch the live stream, how can one do that? So um, any of you feel free to, uh, to respond. Phyllis? Well, just on that, um, it is going to be live streamed from the ICJ. I don't have the, uh, I'll, I'll try and get the, the link in a minute, but it is, it will be available. I think that a simple Google search to say ICJ and live stream will probably get to it, but we'll try and find it as soon as we can. The other question I think is is key. It's the reason we're having this, this webinar. It's the reason for the work that's going on. And it's part of the ongoing work of calling for, for a ceasefire. That remains the most important single thing that has to happen and the most urgent thing for our government. So when we hear Saleh talk about this notion of uh, the obligations of states, you know, to do everything possible to stop the genocide. For us, that's a really easy one. It means to stop sending weapons, to stop sending money, to stop providing impunity for Israel at the United Nations and elsewhere. That's that's it. it it's, it's pretty simple. It's not simple politically to accomplish, obviously. But that's, I think, the framework. And I think being able to use this decision, assuming it's a good decision, and we're all hoping it is, I urge you all to keep all fingers and toes crossed between now and Friday, uh, but assuming that the, that the court is operating as an independent court based on law and not as tools of Western power in the UN system, big assumption, but I think one that at least partially we will see, I think that it means that as the one change that this means is that when we meet with members of Congress, when we protest the Biden administration, when we pass resolutions in city council chambers, all of those can now be linked to, this is now a matter of international law. The International Court of Justice has determined that it is at least plausible, assuming this is the language, at least plausible that a genocide may be approaching or already underway. And therefore, we have obligations it's not just a good idea, somebody's preference. I prefer that we not be part of the genocidal routine here. It's a requirement of international law. And let them come back and say, well, international law doesn't apply to us, or international law is for everybody else in the world, but not for us. Let them argue that. That's an argument we want to have, and it's an argument we can win. So I think this is about giving us a new tool for the work that we're already doing for a movement that is already growing and that is broader than ever before. So that's what we have to consolidate and strengthen. And this is a tool to make that happen. And I'll go look for the, the link. Yeah, I, I think um, for, to agree with Phyllis, first to say it's gonna be uh, live on the UN webcast, UN Web TV, and it's gonna be broadcast live from the International Court of Justice, which I think is www.icj-cij. <laughs> anyway, you can Google it, as, as Phyllis said, or she'll put, put the link up. But on, on what people can do, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of the people who are attending this webinar I see are in the U.S. or in the West. And um, I think we have a particular responsibility here. As you know, there is an effort to brown out information about what's actually happening in Gaza and in the West Bank, um, thanks to our government and to most corporate media uh, in, in the West. So there are people who really don't understand what's happening on the ground. So number one, I think we have to educate our, our fellow citizens and our fellow travelers on, uh, on these things. Um, the U.S. government, the British government, several European governments have been wholly complicit in the genocide. I use that term uh, purposely to de describe a crime that actually exists in the Genocide Convention, the crime of, uh, of complicity. And so we have a responsibility if we're in those countries to make a lot of noise and to push back against both the government institutions that are complicit and media institutions that are disseminating uh, propaganda 
for uh, genocide, incitement to genocide, uh, and, and make sure that we do everything we can to get the story out on our side. That means participating in demonstrations, disruptions, uh, education opportunities, all of, um, all of that. And I know there is a huge crackdown on civil society, on students, on activists and others trying to silence us, uh, an unprecedented crackdown in the US and in the West. Um, those are the moments at which we have to push back even harder, speak up even louder. And I hope that everybody will, will make that a part of their mission in, uh, in the days going forward. And then in the long term, I think Saleh uh, said it best, we need to uh, end this 75 years of impunity, seize the opportunity presented by the case in the world court uh, and the cases uh, presented elsewhere in the in the ICC and in uh, U.S. courts uh, brought by Center for Constitutional Rights, seize this historic opportunity to try to work to end the impunity that allows the genocide. And it, that means participating in boycotts and divestment and sanctions, getting active in the anti-apartheid movement. It was... Uh, as many of us know, it was the anti-apartheid movement in the West working in solidarity with the resistance in South Africa, just churches and schools and students and synagogues and uh, labor unions and others that broke, helped to break the back of apartheid in South Africa. It can happen here as well. So those are the things, these are lessons learned from the past that can be applied today uh, as well. Uh, very quickly, because I think we, uh, in the last few seconds, but basically just building on what Phyllis and Craig have said, ceasefire is a number one top priority. This is uh, 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 what we must all work towards. This is what we hope the provisional measures, the ruling by the court on Friday uh, will also contribute to. But I think it's very important to note that although the court order on provisional measures, measures is mandatory, is obligatory to Israel, we should expect that Israel, it will not be implemented. Uh, it will not be pressured to implement it by its main ally, the US. Uh, Netanyahu, the prime minister of, of uh, uh, Israel has already said that we will not abide by any ruling by, by the ICJ just immediately after the hearings have, have finished. And so just building on what Craig said, it is up to us, it's up to the people to continue on mobilizing, to continue on putting the pressure on peaceful disruptions, to really force the governments, force the governments uh, to enforce the ceasefire in Gaza, stop stop the genocide, uh, stop the forced displacement and the ethnic cleansing. Yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for uh, attending this webinar. Um, and please tune in on Friday and let's stay in touch because we have a lot of work to do indeed. Uh, thank you and take care. Thank you.